so uh, welcome to our podcast speaking our peace and today i am going to talk to a very interesting friend of mine who is working in one part of india which is called vardha where gandhi has started his own ashram and and a school adwait is working there now and he has studied with me and we both have enjoyed so much college life so without delaying much i would invite him to talk about himself here i am presenting adwait who is from india and working in vardha i assume you- Thanks a lot for the introduction and it's such a great pleasure to speak to you about this. I am an engineer. I have grown up in a family where engineering has been a direction of life and I became an engineer uh, in 2008. After that I joined a small startup where we worked on robotics uh, as an educational product and uh, tried to develop robotics labs for school children so that they can learn science and maths through that. I joined this company because of my interest in robotics but soon after working with children I became fascinated in uh, the possibilities of education and what could be done with children so I became interested in education I quit my job and I joined MA education where I met you and that was also the place where I met Gandhi uh, once over again and uh, a few of my professors introduced me to Gandhi so well I became very interested in uh, his thought about education about nation so i have always wanted to try his method i think i feel inspired by what he has expressed in his ideology of neetali i always wanted to experience it so in this pursuit i decided to come to vardha one year ago and join a school called anand niketan which was originally started by gandhi and his colleagues in 1937 to experiment with the same thought process of nay taleem and uh, this is where i have come and very excited to work in the school wow wow so i because i don't know how many of our listeners know what is nay taleem i request you adwait can you tell us little bit about nay taleem and why gandhi proposed that idea sure nay taleem uh, roughly translates into english as new practice and he proposed this as a part of his ideology of hind swaraj of uh, reclaiming uh, the governance of the nation uh, by indians so the reason why he calls it nay taleem is because the educational practice at that time uh, and particularly that education system that was running that was executed by the britishers was originally intended to create clerks for the british governance machinery uh, and it was intended to keep indians at a particular uh, level in the whole system and not let them take leadership reclaim their own nation uh, and relook at their nation as citizens so this is why uh, the idea of nay taleem was proposed and he thought that uh, learning only letters and math and this was not enough to create a whole person to create a whole citizen so what he proposed was that learning should happen in the context of the child in india because there were so many villages and every village had its own craft gandhi proposed that the child should learn through the context of the craft uh, in that village this craft could be anything it could be farming it could be pottery it could be carpentry bamboo work whatever it was because all of this was happening around the child and this was an important medium of livelihood for the village the child would take naturally to learning this craft and if that craft was taught in a scientific way by that i don't just mean learning science through it but learning mathematics learning sociology learning language through it to give you an example if we take the craft of spinning which was which was practiced in many villages in india during that time particularly in context of the indian freedom movement yeah. so if we take the craft of spinning then learning the science of charkha learning how to how the gear ratio works this could be learning science if you have to learn maths it could be about uh, learning uh, you know how many rotations of a spinning wheel would create 
how much length of thread if we were to learn geography it could be learning about cottons in and states which grew cotton in india it could be learning about the soil structure that needed to grow cotton if we have to learn history there is an amazing world of history that is related to cotton right from indian history of how cotton became an important crop in india to the freedom struggle and also international history like growing cotton in america and the history of slavery in america so so every craft could be connected to different topics and that is how the child would learn different subjects that were important through the context of this craft it would gandhi proposed that this would root the learning of the child in india it would be a very indianized and contextual way of teaching anything of learning anything and again community was an important part of neetalim because this had to happen in the context of the child learning through different people in the community was important so i consider it still is a very revolutionary concept and that is what neetalim is yeah yeah that sounds wonderful and uh, i remember now our classes when we used to study all that in our class of neetalim today and i would at this point i would really want to ask atit uh, because you are working in a gandhi school how much that idea is getting translated now how you see that that idea is uh, relevant now and what has changed in today's context yes the great part about nayi taleem and it is in its name is that it is new practice so even though the ideology is you know 80 years old in the crux of it it talks about looking at the context of the child and the you know uh, the community around it so whatever idea was proposed at that time doesn't have to be followed right now we have to you know we have to keep reflecting on what the context is we have to reinvent nayi taleem to suit the child and the needs of the child to present context so in this process it will always be an experimental and innovative educational project so uh, in that context i think there doesn't have to be you know a nayi taleem school all schools that try to deliver education that is contextualized to the child can become nayi taleem in their own respects another thing that i should have mentioned about nayi taleem is that nayi taleem the educational project of nayi taleem should consider the development of the 3h the heart the head and the hand and by that i mean that generally uh, we only focus on development of the head uh, you know cramming new concepts about various subjects into the, into the head of the child there is very less that is done with the hand so first aspect is by learning the craft you also you know work on developing the body of the student yeah. and the third aspect the developing of the heart is basically uh, when you know uh, you develop empathy in the child you develop a perspective in the child to see the world with his or her own perspective with his or her own critical outlook and you know feel compassion for the people feel kindness for the people and not just be constrained by the development of the head but also you know develop some soul Uh, in the process and in that process become holistic citizen of the nation so i think in that respect there is a lot of reflection that has to be done to design a nayi taleem school and there have been there are a lot of new experiments that are going on in the nation currently uh, there used to be a lot of schools of nayi taleem during the independence era uh, now the number of nayi taleem schools has dwindled but there are a lot of alternative schools that have also come up Uh, which are child centric and even though they don't they may not call themselves nayi taleem but the core ideology is similar that the children should learn things in their context in their community and work with their hands and all of this should happen together so i'd say there have been many new projects that are coming up which are very relevant to nayi taleem yeah yeah and i was just talking to shruti also and she has worked in tamil nadu and ahmedabad uh, with the two alternative schools so at this point can you talk little more about the school you are working in the anand niketan school and how in the present times the school works in what activities it uh, involves children with and how you see those children are getting shaped in a different way than a normal traditional school right 
the school is located in a town called Sevagram. This was where Gandhi had settled after coming from Gujarat, from Sabarmati Ashram. So the school is adjacent to that ashram. Sevagram is a town and most of the parents of our children, we have about 280 children in the school from kindergarten to 10th standard. About 90 to 95% of the parents in the school are daily wage earners. So we don't charge fees like a private school. We charge nominal fees to the parents. And the school also runs on um, funding sources like crowdfunding and a few other sources of funding. What happens in the school is that because the context is now different, we also consider children should be enabled to have certification that is necessary for them to pursue whatever aspirations they have. So the school subscribes to the state board the Maharashtra State Board and the children attend the 10th board exams. But while that is happening, the school also attempts to contextualize the syllabus, the curriculum in the crafts that we have, which is mostly divided in two parts. One is for food, which is farming, and second is for cloth. Yeah. And in cloth category, we have two crafts, which is one is spinning and one is tailoring. Uh-huh. So all the children are expected to go through all these three crafts, farming, spinning and tailoring and we also have cooking projects for them every year and all our teachers connect whatever subjects they have to these crafts. For example, if the children are farming, then the math teacher, the class teacher and the farming teacher, all of them work with the children on the farm and right before the first step, which is sowing and plowing, the math teacher explains to the children how to measure the perimeter of the field how to measure the area of the field, how to weigh uh, the seeds that have been sowed, how many rows of seeds have been sowed, how many seeds in each row, so total how many seeds. So a lot of calculations around that is done. And this calculation happens throughout measuring the length of the plant, measuring the leaves, counting the leaves of the plant after periodic time periods, weighing the produce, selling it, counting how much money that has been made, profit loss calculations. Mm -hmm. So all of these things happen in math, uh, in Mm -hmm. science at particular intervals, the science teacher comes to the children uh, to talk about photosynthesis, to talk about root structure, leaf structure, pollination. We call this integration, integration of the subject with the craft. So such integration happens for all subjects, for language, history, geography. That is how we try to cover our syllabus. There are a few topics that may not be able to be integrated naturally. Mm -hmm. In that case, we teach those topics in an activity-based manner. But we constantly prioritize teaching through doing and teaching through contextualizing rather than just textbook teaching. Yeah. So at this point, very interestingly, uh, like this thing comes to my mind because I was talking to Shruti and she uh, like distincts the children because she has worked with children who come from the cities and they have worked on the projects of farming and growing food and because these children have no idea about that, it becomes a very sophisticated activity for the children. And she was saying that in the villages, she has seen that children like very instinctively uh, instinctively know about all these things. So how much you know that this balance can be done because of these things that our subjects are very sophisticated. There's a way to teach subjects as the traditional teachers think. So what work you do with teachers so that they can bridge that gap between the sophistication of the subject and then this instinctive knowledge and the normal which they think that okay this is a very normal uh, knowledge which they have Uh, how do you bridge it so uh, you know it's very interesting we teachers continuously reflect we have a lot of meetings in the school every week we meet twice and these are not just administrative meetings but meetings where we reflect about these things so every year there is reflection about how much we have achieved and what were we able to do and you know one very interesting thing that has been observed is that uh, the craft have their own rhythm for example the craft of farming has its own rhythm there there is a period of sowing to harvesting if the science teachers and the farming teacher they work together they can accommodate some of the subjects according to the seasons Mm -hmm. rather than you know going with the rhythm or the sequence of the textbook chapters because it doesn't make sense at all to go according to the sequence of the chapters. So because we follow the rhythm of the craft, uh, many things come very naturally to the teachers. For example, you know, if pests have attacked the crop, then we don't have to wait to teach 
micro organisms or uh, disease causing insect that is there in science we have to call the children on that day or the next day and uh, show the insects to them uh, show uh, the damage that is done to the crops create organic insecticide uh, spray it and observe what happens after that we have to act according to the rhythm of the craft that craft tells us what is to be done and because it is like that every year there may be you know there would be changes in what we teach in the opportunities that we get to teach if on one day we see a lot of fungal growth on the crops that would be the year that you know we can engage more deep in fungi so similar for cooking you know every year we have projects where the fifth standard children focus on fermentation so they make curd from the he they make dhoklas and idlis by fermenting okay. uh, rice and urad batter so that is where they learn about bacteria we have created these pit stops where we know what we have to achieve but we keep ourselves flexible so that the craft provides us opportunity to teach these things and once we are able to do that then we don't worry a lot about how much of the curriculum are we covering because you know truth be told by the time the children are you know in the 8th 9th or 10th grade if they are able to contextualize their learning through self learning they can very easily attempt the 10th boards of course i mean this is easier said than done there are many children uh, who may have difficulty going through that so we have to focus for those children on developing their academic skills also but certain skills can definitely be very easily developed through craft and which can help them in their formal study also this sounds very interesting because i have never thought uh, in such detail and i, I think i will uh, always remember this thing about craft crafts having their own rhythm so it really makes me question like how the teachers get transformed in the process because i have studied in a traditional school if i have to come to your school i have to really put myself into that kind of you know mindset or i have to go into that rhythm to follow that or to break the rigidity of my mind and go into that flowing mode flexibility to teach children so what do you think like have you seen such kind of processes with teachers or have they told you that they went through that uh, gandhi used to say that a nayi taleem teacher is a karyakarta uh, it may be loosely translated as that a nayi taleem teacher is a reformist and by that he meant that a nayi taleem teacher should not just be a subject expert Uh, he or she also has to be an aware citizen uh, an mm-hmm. empathetic person and a skilled person skilled not only in the subject but also in craft these may seem very high standards for to have for all teachers in a school but actually i think that in any way all teachers have to aspire to reach there and the same is the story for our our school all the teachers perhaps except me Uh, come from the locality they stay in the village that the children also stay in they are a very much part of the community that the children are also a part of and that uh, you know helps the teachers to understand the child not only as a student but also uh, you know the journey of the child the struggles uh, of the families from where the children come from and that uh, i think is a very important strength for the teacher because when the teacher is teaching in the class the teacher understands the child well so the the teacher knows what cues to take and how motivation and inspiration could be provided it could be different for different children and as far as you know understanding the overall view of nayi taleem is concerned it definitely helps to have dialogue dialogue has been an important process in our school uh, we have been a democratic school even though we have a principal and the principals take certain decisions but almost all of the important decisions are taken in teacher meetings considering all opinions and the teachers know that so they do exercise their right to speak the right to decide and it is not always smooth there are definitely uh, moments when there is friction but mm-hmm. that also helps us to understand each other better and uh, there is a certain patience that is required to undergo this process of dialogue to have meetings twice a week to reflect with each other about different issues that the school is facing it creates a brotherhood among teachers which is what you know i have experienced in this school and uh, that helps a lot to give you an example we don't have school going on right now because of corona mm-hmm. but the teachers come here every day we maintain the rules of physical distancing 
but because we can we can see that the school is going to go through tough times in the coming few months uh, we have all decided to work together and generate as much as productive work as we can so all of us teachers have decided to come every day and do three uh, labor intensive works every day we do farming we do spinning and we do stitching uh, because whenever the school start the children are going to need masks and they may not all be able to afford masks so all the teachers have started stitching these masks and uh, same is with growing food we we all are growing food here we do farming every day and also we spin our own yarn every day so these activities uh, doing them together bring us back to the ground to the platform where we see what direction are we heading and uh, what do we intend to do uh, in nai taleem so these activities and dialogues help a lot in generating this culture and growth of teachers yeah that sounds beautiful and i think that is a slow process and there is no like perfect teachers will come into the school and start teaching but person willing to change himself or herself and willing to see with awareness and empathy i think that person can learn a lot Absolutely. and yeah and with that i was when you told me that there are three people who come together and they make certain kind of curriculum for children like the math teacher or the class teacher and the farm teacher i'm sure it must also be breaking some kind of social structures in the school is that what you see in the school because i have seen it in the organizations and that doesn't get you know like the, there are people who are working in the farm there is there are people who are into administration but they never get mixed up so what has been your experience with that kind of you know maybe oh, yes. dismantling <laughs> actually uh, very well caught actually that is such a subtle value that we see in our school there is an ingrained understanding of hierarchy based on the work that we do that you know labor is somewhere of less importance and the work of the brain is of more importance so a science teacher is considered you know more important to a school than a farming teacher but those ideas are broken on a daily level these ideas of hierarchy are broken i, I won't say that you know everyone who is in the school all the children who study here are reformed and you know have ideas of equality they carry a lot of biases from their communities also so it is a continuous process of speaking with them creating this equal platform the farming teacher claiming the authority that he or she holds when farming classes are going on and similarly with teachers of other crafts so that hierarchy has to be broken it keeps coming up and we consider those as opportunities to address these biases and you know we also have somewhere where one place where these biases are confronted directly is the cleaning task we are a staff of 26 teachers in this school and no person in the staff is a non teaching staff all of us are teachers here we do not have any person in the staff whose sole duty is cleaning the school so all the teachers and all the children together are supposed to clean the school every day we have formed vertical groups of children and teachers and all the teachers uh, handle a group of children and they clean one part of the school every day this includes a toilet this includes uh, the office area this includes the kitchen none of the teachers ask the children to do anything that the teacher himself or herself is not willing to do when cooking happens and stitching happens many biases gender related biases come up but in our school male teachers are as excited about cooking and stitching and the children see this and like i said before they carry many biases from their home but in the school they see some role models it is their own process it is their own journey of understanding these biases looking at them reflecting on them but there are opportunities where we can talk about it yeah actually i i am remembering now when i was in seva gram i have seen children cleaning that yeah. area yeah so uh, this brings me to one like i am intrigued how these children when they pass out of the school how do they see their life as because many of the other children must be going into traditional schooling or uh, some other uh, you know public schools so how they see their life as and whether you have any anecdote or any story to share with us yes so one part that maybe i could have mentioned earlier is that this school 
Anand Niketan school even though it started in 1937 it was stopped after a certain time because of practical and political constraints it started again in 2005 so relatively we are a younger school we have three batches that have graduated from 10th standard so right now our eldest batch is has just entered undergraduate college so it would be too soon to tell about you know how do they look at uh, their life in terms of careers but i can tell you what their aspirations are because this is a small town like any other small town in india uh, the aspiration to earn and to secure a job in one of the mainstream areas is very strong so the children here also want to get into the mainstream directions they want to get into medicine uh into engineering and frankly we are not very concerned by that we do acknowledge it as a very strong core you know from the rest of the world to get into such secure jobs but we also see this as you know an opportunity to maybe look at those professions differently so we support the children in their decisions uh, we believe it is their decision to make and whatever it is we will support them uh, we do have alumni coming to school meeting us talking about their struggles so we do support them in their decisions we also see that these children have developed a certain sensitivity about you know issues like environment for example and they do think about certain things they do reflect on what is happening outside they are comfortable talking about issues that they yeah. feel about yeah i would say that is there i i will not claim that the children who have gone through schooling in ananiketan are transformed and are you know out of this world <laughs> they i think there are certain seeds that are sown which sprout in their own time and what we can do is support them in this time so maybe in a few years i'll be able to answer that question much better <laughs> yeah surely <laughs> and and that brings me to another question of uh, like because parents are also part of community hmm. how do you see your teacher parents meeting as because i understand that their aspirations also and their dreams for their children then how do they acknowledge this naitali mighty of education so we do have regular teacher parent meetings even apart from the formal meetings because the teachers are also part of the community uh, you know there are informal conversations that keep happening as part of the school we try to create dialogue with the parents where we can reflect on what kind of learning do we want our children to have access to uh, what kind of citizens do we foresee our children becoming uh, we have dialogues about that we are continuously engaged in a process where parents don't only focus on aspirations of earning you know a lot of money which is completely understandable by the way because like i said 90 to 95% of the parents are daily wage earners and they do not have secure jobs so we completely acknowledge and see where they are coming from and we at no point do we say that these aspirations are wrong but we do try to also uh, speak about a larger vision so to say where earning money may not be the only whole and sole purpose of education but also becoming an aware citizen and in that respect we have dialogue uh, during parent teachers meeting uh we have certain activities where we involve our parents for example currently we have an activity going on where we are encouraging children to take seeds from the school and start their own kitchen garden and uh, we have appealed to parents to encourage children to start their own kitchen garden so through these activities we also try to reach parents and i think the parents they certainly are open to our ideas they see this also as something that is important at the same time because of their situations uh, they think that their aspirations also are important mm-hmm. so there's a balancing that keeps on happening and our job is take that balance ahead mm-hmm. one step at a time yeah i really feel wonderful and happy that uh, you are acknowledging that context and then their dreams and aspirations because sometimes we get a stick to our ideals and we dream so much about our ideals that we miss that aspect yes yeah. and and if we do not see those and include those aspirations in our project then we are not contextualizing our education for us to be nahi taleem we have to accept whatever the context is and and go ahead from there yeah so it has been wonderful talking to you adwaid also this last question i really because listening from you all this and uh, this has been a great journey and now i'm seeing it 
how your life values have changed with this kind of experimentation by being with children by being in a gandhian institute and working with those value system do you see a change in yourself and do you feel that you are willing to try different things no no there has been a lot of change my experience here and like i said i'm very young here but my experience here has given me a lot to think about so after coming to sevagram and staying with the teachers staying in a small community of teachers and also interacting with children going village this idea of community slowly you know started to seep into me and i felt that it has made me grow into a person who looks at my existence as being connected to the community i feel so secure now i feel we keep thinking about earning so much money so that we don't have to ask for any favors to anyone have uh, what is it called financial security or things like that after coming here there's this kind of security that i have uh, with my neighbors i have also become part of their community so they also uh, you know approach me if they think that i could help them out with something else and those connections those relations they help me grow as a person i i say and um, that has been a big learning for me and i won't say that i'm completely merged into the community it's such a long process but oh. that has started that process started and i feel so excited about it that's beautiful advait because we all find it so hard to feel home at some place but if you are feeling that even if a bit that is really beautiful i think it has been wonderful talking to you your journey your experimentation in the school your learnings from the school and your teaching into the school we all of us we look to you <laughs> when we see that okay adwait is doing that kind of work yeah really uh, i will tell my audience because uh, there are a lot of people from my college who are doing really wonderful work in small villages of india and even in cities and adwait is one of them so it has been wonderful talking to you adwait and thanks a lot uh, asima uh, I, i was thinking maybe i will ask so many questions but it just flowed so i feel wonderful and grateful to you about that Super. Yeah. So Thank all you. the best for this school, and I'm feeling very motivated. I'm also starting a kitchen garden on the terrace. So amazing. So as you are also involved with the work while children are waiting and working at homes, uh, we will also yeah. do our bits at our homes. Awesome. Super. <laughs> Good luck to you too, Ashima. Thank you, Adwait. Thank you, and thank you to all the teachers. They agreed to you to speak on this platform, and to all the children who make a part of the community, all the parents who are working hard in these times. Yes, thank you so I much. Yes, I will convey this to them. Okay, Adwait. Thank you. Bye. Bye.